Mars hints from strange gas levels that may be biological in origin, including methane and the recent discovery of oddly varying oxygen levels, to potential microfossils found in meteorites originating on Mars, there are no shortage of indicators that Mars may not be the dead world that we once thought. Mars could have life, at least on the microbial level. But perhaps most tantalizing of these hints was the labeled release experiment on NASA's Viking landers in the 1970s. The experiments were designed to directly detect the presence of microbes on the surface of Mars. They returned a positive. My guest today was integral to the labeled release experiment, and as further study comes in, may prove to have been among the first scientists on planet Earth to have discovered alien life. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Patricia Ann Strout. Dr. Strout was a co-experimenter of the labelled release life detection experiment and a member of the biology flight team on the 1976 Viking mission, the first spacecraft to successfully land on Mars. She was also a team member of the Mariner 9 mission, the first spacecraft to orbit Mars. Dr. Strout earned her PhD in biochemistry from Johns Hopkins University. She became a health scientist administrator at the National Institutes of Health, retiring in 2001. Dr. Strout wrote her memoir to Mars with Love, the true and intimate account of a young woman's journey into space exploration sciences. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Patricia Ann Stratt, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Now, Dr. Mars hints, you know, it gives us these sort of clues that there may be something going on there as far as microbial life, methane blooms, and things like that. Now, your experiment with the Viking landers, the labeled release experiment, stands out of particular importance because it gave a positive. Could you give us an overview of what this experiment did? Sure. And I'd like to say that it, this, the life detection tests that were sent to Mars in 1976 are the only life detection tests that have ever been sent to Mars. And ours, the labeled release experiment, was positive for microbial life. Um, the principle of the experiment was based on heterotrophic metabolism or the type of metabolism uh, uh, that, that's typical of animal metabolism. And that is, if you consume organic compounds and they're metabolized, then the end product is carbon dioxide. We all eat food and exhale carbon dioxide. And that was the principle of the labeled release experiment. We prepared a nutrient consisting of several very simple organic compounds and put it on soil and looked for the evolution of gas. Now, the trick of the experiment was that we labeled the organic compounds with radioactive carbon and therefore when the gas was evolved it was radioactive and we monitored the headspace over the soil for the evolution of radioactive gas. So if there were microorganisms in the soil that metabolized those substrates then you would see a rapid evolution of radioactive gas. Well, that wasn't enough to prove that you had a life response. What we next did is we took a duplicate sample of the same soil and we first heat sterilized it at 160 degrees centigrade to kill any microbial metabolism. And then we added the nutrients, the same radioactive nutrients. And if there was no evolution of radioactive gas, then that indicated we had killed the microorganisms and that the active response where we had we just used the soil without heat sterilizing it was indeed 
a positive microbial response. A positive microbial response. So this would suggest that not only would this be, this, this is recognizable life. This would be microbes as we know them. This would be microbes. Well, as most, most uh, on Earth, the end product would be carbon dioxide. On Mars, you don't know what the end product is, but it would be a carbon-based gas. That's what we were looking for. It could have been carbon dioxide. It could have been carbon monoxide. It could have been methane. Any of those gases would have been detected. Now, how was the uh, suite of nutrients chosen? Did you basically say, well... Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> it, took about, it took a good year or so to finalize what those nutrients were. First of all, we wanted them to be very simple compounds. And we chose compounds like glycine, which is a very simple compound, and alanine. Those were the two amino acids. For those amino acids that were optically active, they had a right and a left-handed form, such as alanine did. We included both optical isomers. We also included formate, which is a very simple compound, and glycolic acid, and lactate. And lactate, a carbohydrate lactate, also had DNL forms, and we included both of those because there's a preference on Earth for those. And if there was a preference on Mars, we didn't know what that preference would be, so we included both isomers. So that, that, Is that clear? That's chirality, essentially. So you were prepared to detect either type, even though we only see one type on Earth. Yes, but we, on Earth with, um, with alanine, the L isomer is metabolized, and, the, and with lactate, the D isomer is almost exclusively metabolized. In fact, we have proposed follow-on experiments based on that, where if we separated those isotopes and tested L and D forms separately, if one was metabolized preferentially over the other, that would be almost proof positive that, way, that you were detecting a life response. Unfortunately, we didn't have that option on Viking, and so we included both isomers. We'd hate to have chosen one and have, to have it be the wrong, the wrong one. Follow-on experiments, what would these look like? What would you go further with in testing for life? Well, when, with the experiment that we sent, consisted of all those seven substrates that I have just mentioned, we, the, we would have liked to have separated them and tested each one of them individually. That would have been the most important experiment to, to run as a follow-on experiment. Unfortunately, no further life detection experiments have ever been sent to Mars. Now, why is that? Why is, NASA seems almost gun-shy. Oh, my. I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's beyond me. You know, when you have such an exciting result, uh, the, the first thing as a scientist that I would do is follow up immediately. We had a spare lander ready to go, and, uh, and the whole team was assembled and ready to go, and yet uh, there was a change of administration, and the money just went out of space research. The Viking mission was in 1976, and there wasn't another mission sent to Mars for another 20 years later. And by then, uh, all, everything had changed. But no life detection tests have been sent since. And it's one of those things where you would think that the public, the taxpayer, that's what we really want to know is, <laughs> is there some sort of life on Mars? Especially with it hinting so much. Not only do we want to know it for the sake of knowing it, but we also want to know it for, because we're returning Mars samples here. And in returning Mars samples, we really do not want to return alien life. And I keep pressing to send life detection tests up there. I'd like to see them a whole battery of life detection tests set up there in advance of returning Mars samples. I don't think it's going to happen, but I sure would like to see it. Well, it seems to be prudent. It's just simple prudence because even though it failed, they tried to do that with Apollo, as, as you remember, that they... They at least made an attempt to make sure that we weren't bringing anything back from the moon, as unlikely as that might seem. Didn't really work, as I recall, Buzz Aldrin saw ants coming in. Well, there were a lot of problems in returning the sample from the moon. I guess nobody was really excited about it because nobody believed there was any possibility of life on the moon. But as a test example for bringing alien life back here, 
it really was kind of a failure. Not good, but we, with Mars, a lot more thinking has been put into that, at least, that we have some sort of planetary protection yes. protocols and things like that, that that we would want to uh, make sure we don't bring anything back. But is it really that dangerous, though? Because could could anything like that that evolved on another world, assuming it did, I mean, we also have you know, the, the possibility of panspermia and things like that. But could it really infect us, or is it just, how do you know, I suppose? Yeah. How do you know? How, how Do you have any basis for knowing? And in my own personal feeling is that unless you know something, it's better to be safe than sorry. And and treat, treat it as if it could be potentially lethal. If it isn't, great. Um, but... Uh, it, just on the offhand chance that maybe you're bringing back something that is lethal, I think you should take every possible precaution. You know, and you could also flip it around because we don't want to bring anything lethal to Mars. In other words, <laughs> we don't want to kill off the Martian microbes that we're trying to discover. Well, you know, that's an interesting issue because uh, y- y- there have been so many landings on Mars now that it's it, that it's amazing if it's not contaminated by terrestrial hitch, hitchhikers and if by any chance we have sent up microorganisms up there i would imagine that they would be um dispersed all over the planet because of the high dust storms yeah so it could be it could be very complicated now to do life experiments on mars because we may have already contaminated it well that's exactly right and and I would like to see, you know, they have special areas set aside that they where they think it's more likely that there might be life than other places. And I would like to see them go there now and test for life and those special places before before it's in, before it's too late and they are they really are contaminated if they're not already. There is also the possibility of fossils too, that maybe Mars may not have life now, but maybe it once did, and we can look for that. Oh yes. That's certainly a possibility. And in fact, of course... That's certainly a possibility. You, you touched very briefly in your book on the Allen Hills meteorite, where there was that 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 situation where it looked like maybe there were microfossils in there? Yes, well, that's, that's a very controversial issue, whether or not those... It's still controversial to this day, but I think the general feeling is that there, those that uh, meteorite... Um, does not show fossils, but it's controversial. Now, the labeled release experiment, this was present on both Viking landers, right? Yes. Was there any difference between the two, or does it, did, it, did they basically give identical results? Well, they gave, uh, on, on, each, on each lander, we had four test cells. And on each lander, two of those were dedicated to an active response. In other words, we put, we put nutrient on or the, the, the uh, radioactive substrates on the soil and watched for the evolution of radioactive gas. And those four um, results, two on each lander, were essentially identical. They were slightly different in magnitude, but they were, they were, both, they were all overwhelmingly positive. Now, on the first lander, we did the 160-degree control cycle, where we heated the, preheated the soil to 160 degrees centigrade, and what we observed was that that completely eliminated the active response. That was only done once and only on the first lander. On the second lander, well, I have to back up a little bit, but of course, you know, these results were challenged immediately. Everybody was extremely skeptical that the, they indicated life, although it, it did satisfy the pre-mission criteria for defining life. But as soon as we got that response, everybody jumped all over it and came up with all kinds of alternative explanations based on some exotic chemical causing them. And what we tried to do, we tried to figure out if there was some way that we could differentiate whether or not it was a chemical or a biological reaction. And the idea came up that if we could sterilize the soil at a lower temperature, much lower than the 160 degrees, that might distinguish between whether or not it was, was uh, biological or chemical. Um, for example, uh, if, if we only heated it to 50 degrees, that's not much above uh, the human body temperature, which is... 37 degrees. 
And if that that uh, destroyed or partially destroyed the uh, active response, that would be a pretty good indication that the result was biological because very few chemicals are affected by such a low temperature. But you would expect microorganisms on Mars to be affected by such a temperature because they are accustomed to much, much lower temperatures on the surface of Mars. So on the second lander, one of the cycles, we, we figured out a way to preheat the soil to only 50 degrees centigrade. And that, that uh, reduced the magnitude of the response significantly, maybe, maybe, by, maybe by about oh, 70%. There were problems with that cycle, though, and we repeated it on, on, the, on the remaining cycle, and that showed a 70% reduction in the magnitude of the response, which is one of the strongest evidence that we have uh, for why we were saying that, that the active response was a biological response. Now, the Viking landers were very, they were very distant from each other, so this, whatever this is. They were about 4,000 miles, 4, miles apart. So whatever the agent is, it was very widespread. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because chemically, you know, the people that make the argument that it was chemistry, that gets a little bit complicated when you separate that distance and and what's available geologically in the area. Yes. But if it's life... Well, well the other thing is, is that the last cycle on Lander 1, what we wanted to do was see what would happen if we did gave it a double shot of nutrient. And uh, we did that, but we didn't get any response at all. Well, that soil had been stored at about in the soil hopper for about, uh, oh, maybe 80 or 90 days and uh, at 10 degrees centigrade. And that turns out that that also destroyed the active response, which is further strong evidence um, that the reaction was biological because not many chemicals are destroyed by long-term storage at 10 degrees C, but you would expect that that, 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 that such a temperature treatment would affect Martian microorganisms. So those are basically the experiments that were performed on, on, um, on the landers. So they, they, were, they were both identical. You asked the question, what's the difference? Well, the difference was in the thermal controls between the two, but all of them, um, uh, all of the active cycles, two on each lander, were essentially identical. So, in the storage of, say, you have a microbial colony inside, and it's it dies essentially because it can't, um, it just can't live in inside of a storage capsule. Now, what? What was the threshold? Well, it can't live at 10 degrees centigrade. 10 degrees centigrade, yeah. What was the threshold, though? I mean, how much how much of a bacterial sample did you need in order to detect it? So, is it what I'm? I guess what I'm saying is it a, is it a handful of microbes, or is the soil just infected with it? Well, gosh, well, we used a, approximately half a cc of of a soil sample in each test cell, and uh, based on what comparable responses in terrestrial samples it was a very low microbial count uh, if you can if, if the comparison is valid um, but I, I don't I really don't know how many microbes it would have represented if that's what you're asking but it would suggest yeah basically I'm, I'm, is, is it is it a are we looking at a picture of a, of a microbial colony that is just barely eking out a living on Mars, or did it find a way to thrive? And I guess just the detections would say that it's thriving. Well, we had a, we had a, a plateau level of maybe around 10 to 13,000 uh, CPMs, counts per minute. Uh, a very active terrestrial soil would have given us a, a comparable level of maybe 120,000, 150,000 in that range. So it was much lower than you, than a, a response from a very active terrestrial soil. Yeah, that's interesting. Very active. So Mars would probably be healthy then if, if <laughs> the Mars life would be healthy. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is, is on a terrestrial soil, uh, when all the nutrient is used up, the reaction plateaus. And that's what happened on 
Um, that's what happened on on Mars. It plateaued, but it plateaued at about one one tenth to one fifteenth the level that that you would see that on a terrestrial sample. And that has indicated to many people that maybe only one of the seven substrates was totally used. That maybe maybe the Martian organisms only picked out one of those seven substrates. And that's why the plateau level is much lower. But it's impossible to distinguish whether it was total utilization of one substrate or whether it was just partial utilization of all the substrates. It's, it, uh, unfortunately, we, the, the, the data doesn't allow us to distinguish between those two possibilities. And we have to take a break. When we come back, we'll get more into the story of how the labeled release experiment came about. I'm joined today by Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt, author of To Mars with Love, telling the story of this experiment that may well have detected life. To Mars with Love is available from tomarswithlove.com. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And now, back to John. And we're back with Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt. Now, Doctor, how did this start, the, the idea for the labeled release experiment? How long did it take to create the experiment? Well, the original design of the experiment was by uh, Gilbert Levin. He was the principal experimenter on this experiment, and he came up with this idea, oh, maybe, I don't know, several years before the actual experiment was funded for the Viking mission. And it was funded in 1970 to turn his laboratory experiment into a flight experiment. And he needed somebody to work with him. And I, uh, I happened to be looking for a job at that particular time. I was thinking of a career move. And when Gil Levin offered me the job to come and work with him on turning this experiment into a flight experiment, I was flabbergasted. Mars was so far out in 1970 that it just seemed like, like uh, it was just pie in the sky. It seemed like it was. Uh, I was an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins at the time, and I must admit I kind of thought of it as a potential suicidal career move. But you know, it sounded like so much fun, and I had confidence that if it was a total bust, I'd somehow land on my feet. So I. I said goodbye to an academic career, and I joined Gil Levin to turn this experiment into a, a flight experiment. And not much was known about Mars back then, um, and I didn't know anything about Mars when I, I joined Gil. I knew it was the fourth planet out from the sun. Nobody else knew much about it either. There had been flybys, and those flybys had shown that Mars was full of craters, and in fact, there had been a headline in the New York Times saying that Mars was a dead planet. And the only thing that was known was that it, was, it had a lot of craters and it had polar ice caps consisting of frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice and that it was a hostile environment. And in fact, as I think back on what they knew about Mars, I'm amazed that it was even funded to go look for life on Mars. But there had been speculations for years and years starting with Percival Lowell back around 1900, that there might be intelligent life on Mars. So I guess that's kind of what inspired it to go and look. Anyway, it was funded in 1970, and I worked hand-in-hand -hand with the engineers in, in uh, building the flight instrument and testing whether or not the flight instrument actually did, in fact, uh, perform an adequate labeled release experiment. Now, that took you to all sorts of places like Antarctica, right? Oh, no, I didn't go to Antarctica. Wolf Fishniak went to Antarctica. There was a challenge that says, well, uh, how can you expect to have life on Mars if you can't even have life in a hostile terrestrial environment like Antarctica? And Wolf Fishniak, who actually there were originally four experiments um, scheduled to go to Mars, and Wolf was the experimenter of one of them, Anyway, he went down to Antarctica to try and show that there was, in fact, uh, life in Antarctica and that it could reproduce. And I was involved with that only in providing him a field with a, a uh, field kit so that he could perform the labeled release experiment along with his own experiments. 
And it, it turned out that he, in fact, was able to show that there was microbial life down there. And his story is a very interesting one, and it is in my book in detail, but I'll leave it for people to read about that. It's a very interesting story with a tragic ending, unfortunately. Unfortunately, but at the same time, even in, in itself, on its own, showing that there's you know, microbial life in Antarctica is is major major science yes it is yes it is now we have private companies these days you know the the terrain is very different we have private companies wanting to go to mars spacex oh yes now what warning would you give them given that they 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 put things like settling mars on the table what what warning would you give them what experiments do they need to do to try to determine what's there before putting a human on Mars? Well, I think they're plowing ahead with with doing that. I think Mars is an extremely hostile planet to human beings. And uh, uh, the the book The Martian uh, lays out some of the problems. I think think they'll they'll even be more severe than are presented in The Martian. And uh, I, I, I guess it's a challenge that's there, and it's going to be the people are going to try to conquer that. Despite the hostile environment, one of the most difficult things, of course, other than the cold and the uh, atmosphere and the radiation, I, I think is the fact that the atmospheric pressure is one two hundredth that that it is here on Earth, and that you're it's like walking into a vacuum, and that's going to pre- present a lot of difficulties. But I don't think um, I, I don't think there's any stopping. The fact that somebody is going to try to put a man on Mars doesn't seem to be anything stopping it. And there's always a certain type of person on this world that will do anything extreme like that. You know, people will climb. Absolutely. They will climb Mount Everest and they will go to Mars. And I think that this is. That's exactly right. But it seems. And the interesting thing is, are we going to bring them back? <laughs> that's where I was going with this. Um, because if we do bring them back, then we need to make sure that they're not bringing uh, stowaways so to speak. Well, theoretically, I believe the, they're going to have a return sample mission first, and hopefully that problem will be solved before we send a man to, uh, or a woman to Mars and bring them back. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I think it's a, it's a big unknown as to what's happening, but for sure nobody's going to stop uh, exploring Mars. And we're going to bring back samples, and we're going to send somebody up there and eventually bring them back. The, the, I suppose the lucky thing is, is that we at least have some kind of an indicator, because through panspermia, Earth and Mars have been transferring material for their entire existence. Well, that's the theory. Nothing bad has happened that we know of. That we know of. That we know of. <laughs> well, it, it, well, I think the most interesting scenario would be You know, well, I should say it this way. It's interesting either way it goes. If it turns out that the Martian life are cousins and that panspermia occurred, where are we originally from? You know, um, where did life on Earth start? Did it start on Mars or vice versa? Um, Did Mars... Or did it start independently? Yeah. Or is it completely alien, independent life? That's why the experiment that we proposed um, using separating the L and D isomers would be so interesting because if Mars showed a preference for one or the other isomers, that that would be almost proof positive that you have life. But what if the preference was opposite that it is on Earth? On Earth, we use L amino acids and D carbohydrates. What if it was the opposite on Mars? What if they preferred D amino acids and L carbohydrates? That would be almost proof positive. Uh, of an independent evolution of life, wouldn't that be exciting? It was unbelievably exciting. It would change the. <laughs> it would change our our entire perception of life in this universe. Yes, it would. <laughs> now, given the that that there was debate at the time over the detection, since then things have been found with Mars that seem to strengthen the case for the labeled release experiment. Oh, yeah. For example, at the time, no one knew that. There were organics, and they didn't seem to be there. But yet, subsequently, we've detected organics on Mars. What are what what are some of these these indicators that are strengthening the uh, conclusions for the labeled release experiment? Well, let's talk about the organics. Uh, 
yes, we found complex organics, but the intriguing thing to me is we haven't yet found the simple organics. We haven't found amino acids, but we have found some complex organics on Mars. And it's um, uh, one of the possible reasons why we, we that why Viking never found organics is we know there are perchlorates in the soil, and if they had taken Mars soil and heated it like they do in the GCMS to detect organics, it's possible that heating them in the presence of the perchlorates destroyed them before they could ever be detected. And uh, that may be the, it's possible that that may be the reason why they were, um, they were not detected during Viking. And in fact, that's why I'd like so much to see liquid extractions that don't, that don't heat up the chemicals to see if you can find uh, simple organics. Well, okay, so, so it's tantalized. The organic story is very tantalizing, but it's no longer a very good argument for, for saying that the labeled release experiment was uh, non-biological. The other thing is that we're finding more and more water on Mars, and uh, that was the other argu- one of the other arguments as to why the labeled release uh, positive results were not Uh, readily accepted as indicative of life. Uh, So that doesn't seem to be an argument either. Now, there's not very much water, but perhaps it's enough to support life. Um, In fact, I love the idea of taking uh, Martian soil and putting uh, water on it because of the phenomena of cryptobiosis. You know, it's possible that Mars evolved a long time ago, and as environmental conditions became more and more hostile, Um, Martian organisms may have gone into hibernation. And we know this phenomenon of cryptobiosis. We don't know how long something could survive in that form, but it could be millions of years. And it's just like uh, uh, you put water back on it and maybe, maybe you reactivate the life. Maybe it comes out of hibernation. Anyway, it's a, that's a very exciting idea. Uh, but the other thing to really consider is that in addition to finding environmental conditions that are that are, that are uh, indicate uh, it's not quite as inhospitable as we thought it was, the thing of it is about the labeled release experiment is that many, many people have tried to replicate those results non-biologically. Nobody has succeeded. Not once. So there's n- nothing. Nobody close. has succeeded. Now that's a that's a compelling. And they can, re- yeah, it is. And the problem is they don't meet the thermal constraints. Some of them have met constraints of being destroyed at 160 degrees C, but but then those the same people who have done that never tested it at the 50 degrees C or the 10 degrees C. And it's very important if you're going to have a theory of to explain the labeled release experiment, you have to explain the thermal constraints, that it was destroyed at 160 degrees, that it was partially destroyed at 50 degrees, and that it was essentially totally destroyed at 10, at, for long-term storage at 10 degrees. And nobody has, nobody has come up with something, some non-biological chemical that does those things. Now, it's interesting you mentioned the the option that this this life can go dormant because we have organisms here on Earth that can dry out, and once you reintroduce water, they come back. That's exactly right. And this idea of even millions of years of of reawakening a Martian microbe, that's just uh, it's out there, but it's amazing. It's it's an amazing thought that life. It really is. Nobody knows how long somebody could how long a, a microorganism could um, uh, survive in a, a cryptobiotic state, but. But people propose many, many, many long years, perhaps millions, who knows. So it's possible that life evolved a long time ago, uh, way back when environmental conditions were more conducive to life. And as conditions got more hostile, it, it, it just went into a high state of hibernation. And they could be, re, they could be uh, reawakened by the introduction of water. Now we have another hint here because we sort of, we see these methane blooms you know, that curiosity is, is detected. And it almost seems like that, that, that maybe there's something underneath the ground producing methane, but not consistently. Yes, that's extremely exciting. So that could be your microbes going dormant and coming back based on the conditions that they're in. Who knows? That's a very exciting finding because methane 
Methane is, is generally, if you have methane in the atmosphere, it's generally considered um, indicative of a life response. Methane has a very short half-life in the atmosphere, and the mere presence of it in the atmosphere of Earth indicates that it is continually replenished. And on Earth, it's replenished by methane bacteria, um, although it can also be um, it can also be replenished by volcanoes, uh, but they're mostly on Earth. It's, it's, um, the cause is from um, metabolism by methane bacteria. And the fact that we're finding it on Mars is indicative of the fact that it is constantly replenished. And whether or not that's biological or non-biological is yet to be shown. Uh, there hasn't been any recent volcanic activity on Mars. So the... the uh, the explanation is up in the air but uh, as to whether or not that's biological, which is exciting. And by the way, there are methane bacteria that do utilize some of the substrates that were in the labeled release nutrient. And it is not impossible that we detected the activity of, of methane bacteria. That's interesting because, you know, um, my sense is that Mars is a very harsh place, worse than Earth, for methane. It's just methane just shouldn't exist but it does therefore it's whatever is producing it is producing a lot of it and it's doing it regularly so you have to wonder on a planet cyclical yeah cyclical and volcanoes are not cyclical so you know or at least as unless under certain really special conditions like a, a geyser or something like that they you usually wouldn't see that but life is seasonal here on earth so why wouldn't it um suggest that that you know, this methane is biological in nature. Exactly. Mars, Mars is a very tantalizing planet. It is, and it's, it's, it's actually really exciting to look at it from a broader perspective because we, we don't just have Mars. We have Europa, <laughs> Enceladus, um, even Venus, maybe, that might also be hinting. But nothing is hinting as strongly as Mars, as I, I think. And the methane is a is one more reason to suspect that the labeled release experiment found something. Um, because it's, if the shoe fits, right? Well, the shoe fits, and, and I'm certainly inclined to believe it detected microbial activity. Um, whether or not it did remains to be proven. And if it, if it did, it's probably the most exciting finding ever. If it didn't, it's still an exciting experiment, a first ever attempt to put it. Um, a life detection experiment on another planet. And it's it's fascinating to think that we may have already discovered alien life. It's it, it, it's a, an exciting prospect, yes. Now, where do we go from here? Who do people need to talk to and write to at NASA to try to get them to go in a direction to directly try to detect life again? Well, that I can't answer. We've been we've been uh, sub we've submitting proposals for years and years to try and send back a labeled release experiment, or some other ones, and it hasn't happened. So that I can't answer you. I don't I don't know. I I can't speak for NASA. I don't know what their thinking is and why they haven't sent direct life detection tests. I mean, what they have sent are are missions that look for habitat to see if there's a habitat compatible. Uh, with life, but they have not directly looked for life, which has been a big disappointment for me. Yeah, it seems like they, they want to look for the conditions for life, but they don't want to actually look for the life. And that seems to me to be counterproductive, to say the least. <laughs> it, it delays the answer to the question, essentially. Yeah. Now, if it is confirmed that we have microbes on Mars, should we go back and revisit the labeled release experiment and see if it was that was the discovery and should that be for all times the credit should go to the labeled release experiment in the discovery of life if it's if it turns out that that you you guys were right um and i think you were i personally i'm i find the whole thing convincing it needs to be remembered that that was the experiment that did it you know as opposed to <laughs> some yeah so i i want to make sure that that history knows that that this was probably the the first detection of alien life and yes, I, 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 and I hope my book shows that. Now, this your book, to, to Mars with Love. Yes, was a fascinating read, and I, um, it, 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 
tells the story of all of this, the labeled release experiment, and also says uh, what you were doing at the time, um, other than science, or, or actually it's not really that, it's symbolic, right? <laughs> well, yes, I, um, at the time, I worked, I worked hand in hand with the engineers building that experiment I, from about 1970 until 1976. And that is the fascinating story of all the trials and tribulations in getting that experiment to Mars. It seems nothing worked right the first time. But at the same time in my own personal life, I was very much involved in the equestrian world. And sometimes the interaction between the equestrian world and the Viking world was very funny. And I have interwoven those stories with the Viking story. It was. It was very entertaining. Where can people get your book, Tomorrow's With Love? Oh, well, they can get it from my website, which is www.tomorrowswithlove.com. Very easy. And we are out of time. Doctor, it was a pleasure talking to you. And I really, I have to say, the labeled release experiment remains one of the the top things that makes me go, hmm, about the solar system. <laughs> Maybe. Did we find it? Has life on Mars already been detected? That remains to be seen. But in a world where companies like SpaceX push the frontiers of human exploration to the surface of Mars involving humans, it's probably a good idea to determine if there is life already there. More study of the labeled release experiment and successors to it are sorely needed. Dr. Strat's book, To Mars With Love, is available from www.tomarswithlove.com. <laughs>